Growing up in Kent in the late 70s and early 80s, seaside holidays were always the highlight of the year. And because there was a farm to run, my parents went home every morning and every evening to feed the animals and milk the cows. We'd meet my grandparents and my great aunt Joan at a bungalow at Lydon Sea, driving there in our cream Citroen Diane with the roof rolled back. Strangely, I can still remember the number plate of that car. DUF 517V. I think everyone can remember the number plate of their first car. Holidays are always exciting because we got those small cereal boxes, the Kellogg's variety pack. You got to choose different cereal every day. And lollies always had jokes on. I don't know why they don't do those anymore. Because my parents spent a lot of time working on the farm, I spent a lot of time with my elderly relatives. When I think back, I wonder why I never asked my grandparents and my great aunt Joan about their past lives, but it didn't really occur to me. My granddad was quite serious. I knew that he'd been a bank manager in Sheffield, and my mum told me that the famous actor Patrick McGowan had worked for my granddad, who I didn't know at the time, but was famous for being the prisoner and Dr. Sin. And the other story I heard that my aunt Joan did tell me I think because I used to like Doctor Who she said that she once met Doctor Who at a petrol station it turned out it was Patrick Troughton that thing where you recognise someone from TV and you you think you know them it was only later after a conversation that Patrick Troughton had pointed out that she might know him because of Doctor Who so I didn't really think about asking my relatives about their past life and it's, um, you know, I sort of regret that now that I don't know more about them really So yes, it is strange that all I actually know about my grandparents and my great-aunt Joan is they both met famous people called Patrick. I was just there, I didn't think about the past, I just thought about the present. The fun of bouncing on a trampoline, sellotaping and squashing a half bee on the railway line. The bungalow we stayed in it backed onto a, a small steam railway, the Romney Hive and Dimchurch Railway. The smell of the steam train chuffing along all the weather-beaten back fences of the bungalows. And that sound of the whistle always brought us out to wave at the people in the carriages passing by. And although it was a traditional pastime for us, although probably not to be advocated, was sellotaping a half P to the railway line and then waiting for the train to run by and squash it to twice its size. That was always a satisfying activity. So if waiting for the steam train to rattle past the back fence of the bungalow was exciting, going to the big station at New Romney was the pinnacle. This is where you could see the trains up close. Northern Chief, Southern Maid, Hercules, Typhoon, Hurricane. We used to collect all the badges. They have these lovely enamel badges. You can still get them. And then you could get on the train and you could go all the way up to Dungeness. And there were two lighthouses up at Dungeness. There was the old lighthouse and the new lighthouse. I remember walking up all those steps to the top of the old lighthouse, looking out across all those pylons, all those pebbles, all those fishing huts and some ramshackle houses. And once the tide had gone out so far and I decided to walk out across that strange netherworld between the land and the sea, but I could hear that hush of the waves in the distance and I find myself walking and walking and walking so far till eventually I reach the sea, turn back and walk for what seemed even further to get back somehow. Why would it be further to get back? But it turned out I started walking at a rather obtuse angle and found myself miles along the coast road and uh, eventually I was discovered and brought back So I spent a lot of my time walking along the tide lines, looking for treasures. And I was happy there, finding things that had been rounded and smoothed by the sea. Putting interesting pebbles into my pocket, glistening and shining from the sea water. But as soon as they got home and dried out, they just weren't the same anymore. One day we went night fishing at Dungeness and I caught an eel. That snake-like beast spiralling its way up the beach was absolutely terrifying. 
And the other terrifying thing was our neighbour. And I believe she worked night, so she wasn't that impressed when myself and my brother were playing football out on the front drive early in the morning. One day we made this absolutely huge sand castle. This castle had a huge moat, battlements. We spent hours making the sand castle. And it got to the point where we'd finished it and we had to leave it. And some other boys had obviously had their eye on this sand castle for quite some time. And as we climbed back over the shingle, I remember looking back and seeing them stamping it to the ground. We would spend the evenings playing rummy or pontoon, gambling with a large collection of half peas, the ones that hadn't been squashed on the railway line. I can't remember where I got this, but I remember these machines where you put your money in and you get some kind of treasure out. I remember getting a ring in the shape of a snake was the most exciting thing ever and I've managed to keep hold of that since I was about eight. Anyone else looking at that would go, what on earth is that piece of thin twisted metal? But to me, it was the absolute best thing ever.